They all four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer, acrid smell about. I was suspicious, and examined the decanter. It smelt of laudanum, and looking on the sideboard, I found that the bottle which mother's doctor uses for her O oh, did use was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I am back in the room with mother. I cannot leave her, and I am alone, save for the sleeping servants, whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead, I dare not go out, for I can hear the low howl of the wolf through the broken window. The air seems full of specks, floating and circling in the draught from the window, and the lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God shield me from harm this night. I shall hide this paper in my breast, where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother gone, it is time that I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur, if I should not survive this night. God keep you, dear, and God help me, chapter Xi Doctor. Seward's Diary, 18 September. I drove at once to Hillingham and arrived early. Keeping my cab at the gate, I went up the avenue alone. I knocked gently and rang as quietly as possible, for I feared to disturb Lucy or her mother, and hoped to only bring a servant to the door. After a while, finding no response, I knocked and rang again. Still no answer. I cursed the laziness of the servants, that they should lie aid at such an hour, for it was now ten o'clock, and so rang and knocked again, but more impatiently, but still without response. Hitherto I had blamed only the servants, but now a terrible fear began to assail me. Was this desolation but another link in the chain of doom which seemed drawing tight around us? Was it indeed a house of death to which I had come too late? I knew that minutes I could find no means of ingress. Every window and door was fastened and locked, and I returned baffled to the porch. As I did so, I heard the rapid pit-pat of a swiftly driven horse's feet. They stopped at the gate, and a few seconds later I met Van Helsing running up the avenue. When he saw me, he gasped out, then it was you, and just arrived. How is she? Are we too late? Did you not get my telegram? I answered as quickly and currently as I could that I had only got his telegram early in the morning, and had not lost a he paused and raised his hat as he said solemnly, Then I fear we are too late. God's will be done, with his usual recuperative energy. He went on, Come, if there be no way open to get in, we must make one. Time is all in all to us now. We went round to the back of the house, where there was a kitchen window. The professor took a small surgical saw from his case, and handing it to me, pointed to the iron bars which guarded the window. I attacked them at once and had very soon cut through three of them. Then, with a long, thin knife, we pushed back the fastening of the sashes and opened the window. I helped the professor in and followed him. There was no one in the kitchen or in the servants' rooms, which were close at hand. We tried all the rooms as we went along, and in the dining room, dimly lit by rays of light through the shutters, found four servant women lying on the floor. There was no need to think them dead, for their stertorous breathing and the acrid smell of laudanum in the room left no doubt as to their condition. Van Helsing and I looked at each other, and as we moved away he said, We can attend to them later. Then we ascended to Lucy's room. For an instant or two we paused at the door to listen, but there was no sound that we could hear. With white faces and trembling hands, we opened the door gently, and entered the room. How shall I describe what we saw? On the bed lay two women, Lucy and her mother. The latter lay farthest in, and she was covered with a white sheet, the edge of which had been blown back by the draught through the broken window, showing the drawn, white face, with a look of terror fixed. By her side lay Lucy, with face white and still more drawn. The flowers which had been round her neck we found upon her mother's bosom, and her throat was bare, showing the two little wounds which we had noticed before, but looking horribly white. Without a word the professor bent over the bed, 
his head almost touching poor Lucy's breast. The maids were still breathing, but more restlessly, and I fancied that the narcotic was wearing off. I did not stay to make sure, but returned to Van Helsing. He rubbed the brandy, as on another occasion, on her lips and gums and on her wrists and the palms of her hands. He said to me, I can do this, all that can be at the present. You go wake those maids. Flick them in the face with a wet towel, and flick them hard. Make them get heat and fire and a warm bath. This poor soul is nearly as cold as that beside her. She will need be heated before we can do anything more. I went at once and found little difficulty in waking three of the women. The fourth was only a young girl, and the drug had evidently affected her more strongly. So I lifted her on the sofa and let her sleep. The others were dazed at first, but as remembrance came back to them they cried and sobbed in a hysterical manner. I was stern with them, however, and would not let them talk. I told them that one life was bad enough to lose, and that if they delayed they would sacrifice Miss Lucy. So, sobbing and crying, they went about their way, half clad as they were, and prepared fire and water. Fortunately, the kitchen and boiler fires were still alive, and there was no lack of hot water. We got a bath and carried Lucy out as she was and placed her in it. Whilst we were busy chafing her limbs there was a knock at the hall door. One of the maids ran off hurried on some more clothes, and opened it. Then she returned and whispered to us that there was a gentleman who had come with a message from Mr. Holmwood. I bade her simply tell him that he must wait, for we could see no one now. She went away with the message, and, engrossed with our work, I clean forgot all about him. I never saw in all my experience the professor work in such deadly earnest. I knew as he knew that it was a stand-up fight with death, and in a pause told him so. He answered me in a way that I did not understand, but with the sternest look that his face could wear, if that were all, I would stop here where we are now, and let her fade away into peace. Presently we both began to be conscious that the heat was beginning to be of some effect. Lucy's heart beat a trifle more audibly to the stethoscope, and her lungs had a perceptible movement. Van Helsing's face almost beamed, and as we lifted her from the bath and rolled her in a hot sheet to dry her, he said to me, The first gain is ours. Check to the king. We took Lucy. I noticed that Van Helsing tied a soft silk handkerchief round her throat. She was still unconscious, and was quite as bad as, if not worse than, we had ever seen her. Van Helsing called in one of the women, and told her to stay with her and not to take her eyes off her till we returned, and then beckoned me out of the room. We must consult as to what is to be done, he said as we descended the stairs. In the hall he opened the dining room door, and we passed in, he closing the door carefully behind him. The shutters had been opened, but the blinds were already down, with that obedience to the etiquette of death which the British woman of the lower classes always rigidly observes. The room was, therefore, dimly dark. It was, however, light enough for our purposes. Van Helsing's sternness was somewhat relieved by a look of perplexity. He was evidently torturing his mind about something, so I waited for an instant, and he spoke. What are we to do now? Where are we to turn for help? We must have another transfusion. You are exhausted already. I am exhausted, too. I fear to trust those women, even if they would have courage to submit. What are we to do for someone who will open his veins for her? What's the matter with me? Anyhow, the voice came from the sofa across the room, and its tones brought relief. Van Helsing started angrily at the first sound, but his face softened and a glad look came into his eyes as I cried out, Quincy Morris, and rushed towards him with outstretched hand. What brought you here? I cried as our hands met. I guess art is the cause. He handed me a telegram, have not heard from Seward for three days, and am terribly anxious. Cannot leave. Father still in same condition. 
Send me word how Lucy is. Do not delay. Holmwood. I think I came just in the nick of time. You know you have only to tell me what to do. Van Helsing strode forward and took his hand, looking him straight in the eyes as he said, A brave man's blood is the best thing. You are a man and no mistake. Well, the devil may work against us for all he's worth, but God sends us men when we want them. Once again we went through that ghastly operation. I have not the heart to go through with the details. Lucy had got a terrible shock, and it told on her more than before, for though plenty of blood went into her veins, her body did not respond to the treatment as well as on the other occasions. Her struggle back into life was something frightful to see and hear. However, the action of both heart and lungs improved, and Van Helsing made a subcutaneous injection of morphia, as before, and with good effect. Her faint became a profound slumber. The professor watched whilst I went downstairs with Quincy Morris and sent one of the maids to pay off one of the cabin who were waiting. I left Quincy lying down after having a glass of wine and told the cook to get ready a good breakfast. Then a thought struck me, and I went back to the room where Lucy now was. When I came softly in, I found Van Helsing with a sheet or two of notepaper in his hand. He had evidently read it, and was thinking it over as he sat with his hand to his brow. There was a look of grim satisfaction in his face, as of one who has had a doubt solved. He handed me the paper, saying, only, dropped from Lucy's breast when we carried her to the bath. When I had read it, I stood looking at the professor, and after a pause, Van Helsing put out his hand and took the paper, saying, do not trouble about it now. Forget it for the present. You shall know and understand it all in good time. But it will be later. And now what is it that you came to me to say? This brought me back to fact, and I was all myself again. I came to speak about the certificate of death. If we do not act properly and wisely, there may be an inquest, and that paper would have to be produced. I am in hopes that we need have no inquest, for if we had it would surely kill poor Lucy, if nothing else did. I know and you know, and the other doctor who attended her knows, that Mrs. Westenra had disease of the heart, and we can certify that she died of it. Let us fill up the certificate at once, and I shall take it myself to the registrar, and go on to the undertaker, good, oh my friend John, well thought of, truly Miss Lucy. One, two, three all open their veins for her besides one old man. Ah, uh, yes, I know, friend John. I am not blind. I love you all the more for it. Now go. The hall I met Quincy Morris, with a telegram for Arthur Westenra was dead, that Lucy also had been ill, but was now going on better, and that Van Helsing and I were with her. I told him where I was going, and he hurried me out, but as I was going said, when you come back, Jack, may I have two words with you all to ourselves. I nodded in. I found no difficulty about the registration, and arranged with the local undertaker to come up in the evening to measure for the coffin and to make arrangements. When I got back, Quincy was waiting for me. I told him I would see him as soon as I knew about Lucy, and went up to her room. She was still sleeping, and the professor seemingly had not moved from his seat at her side. From his putting his finger to his lips, I gathered that he expected her to wake before long and was afraid of forestalling nature. So I went down to Quincy and took him into the breakfast room, where the blinds were not drawn down, and which was a little more cheerful, or rather less cheerless, than the other rooms. When we were alone, he said to me, Jack Seward, I don't want to shove myself in anywhere where I've no right to be, but this is no ordinary case. You know I loved that girl and wanted to marry her. But, although that's all past and gone, I can't help feeling anxious about her all the same. What is it that's wrong with her? The Dutchman, and a fine old fellow he is. I can see that said, that time you two came into the room, that you must have another transfusion of blood, now I know well that you medical men speak in camera, 
and that a man must not expect to know what they consult about in private. But this is no common matter, and, whatever it is, I have done my part. Is not that so? That's so, I said, and he went on. I take it that both you and Van Helsing had done already what I did today. Is not that so? That's so. And I guess Art was in it, too. When I saw him four days ago down at his own place, he looked queer. I have not seen anything pulled down so quick since I was on the pampas and had a mare that I was fond of go to grass all in a night. One of those big bats that they call vampires had got at her in the night, and what with his gorge and the vein left open, there wasn't enough blood in her to let her stand up, and I had to put a bullet th Jack, if you may tell me without betraying confidence, Arthur was the first, is not that so. As he spoke, the poor fellow looked terribly anxious. He was in a torture of suspense regarding the woman he loved, and his utter ignorance of the terrible mystery which seemed to surround her intensified his pain. His very heart was bleeding, and it took all the manhood of him, and there was a royal lot of it, too, to keep him from breaking down. I paused before answering, for I felt that I must not betray anything which the professor wished kept secret, but already he knew so much and guessed so much that there could be no reason man alive, her whole body wouldn't hold it. Then, coming close to me, he spoke in a fierce half-whisper. What took it out? I shook my head. That, I said, is the crux. Van Helsing is simply frantic about it, and I am at my wit's end. I can't even hazard a guess. There has been a series of little circumstances which have thrown out all our calculations as to Lucy being properly watched. But these shall not occur again. Here we stay until all be well or ill. Quincy held out his hand. Count me in, he said. You and the Dutchman will tell me what to do, and I'll do it. When she woke late in the afternoon, Lucy's first movement was to feel in her breast, and, to my surprise, the careful professor had replaced it where it had come from, lest on waking she should be alarmed. Her eye then lit on Van Helsing, and on me too, and gladdened. Then she looked around the room, and seeing where she was, shuddered. She gave a loud cry, and put her poor thin hands before her pale face. We both understood what that meant, that she had realized to the full her mother's death. So we tried what we could to comfort her. Doubtless sympathy eased her somewhat, but she was very low in thought and spirit, and wept silently and weakly for a long time. We told her that either or both of us would now remain with her all the time, and that seemed to comfort her. Towards dusk she fell into a doze. Here a very odd thing occurred. Whilst still asleep, she took the paper from her breast and tore it in two. Van Helsing stepped over and took the pieces from her. All the same, however, she went on with the action of tearing, as though the material were still in her hands. Finally, she lifted her hands and opened them as though scattering the fragments. Van Helsing seemed surprised, and his brows gathered as if in thought, but he said nothing. E. 19 September all last night she slept fitfully, being always afraid to sleep, and something weaker when she woke from it. The professor and I took it in turns to watch, and we never left her for a moment unattended. Quincy Morris said nothing about his intention, but I knew that all night long he patrolled round and round the house. When the day came, its searching light showed the ravages in poor Lucy's strength. She was hardly able to turn her head and the little nourishment which she could take seemed to do her no good. At times she slept, and both Van Helsing and I noticed the difference in her between sleeping and waking. Whilst asleep she looked stronger, although more haggard, and her breathing was softer. Her open mouth showed the pale gums drawn back from the teeth, which thus looked positively long. In the afternoon she asked for Arthur, and we telegraphed for him. Quincy went off to meet him at the station. When he arrived it was nearly six o'clock, and the sun was setting full and warm, and the red light streamed in through the window and gave more color to the pale cheeks. When he saw her, Arthur was simply choking with emotion, and none of us could speak. 
in the hours that had passed the fits of sleep or the comatose condition that passed for it had grown more frequent so that the pauses when conversation was possible were shortened arthur's presence however seemed to act as a stimulant she rallied a little and spoke to him more brightly than she had done since we arrived he too pulled himself together and spoke as cheerily as he could so that the best was made of everything it was now nearly one o'clock and he and van helsing are sitting with her i am to relieve them in a quarter of an hour and i am entering this on lucy's phonograph until six o'clock they are to try to rest i fear that to-morrow will end our watching for the shock has been too great the poor child cannot rally god help us all let her minna harker to lucy westenra unopened by her seventeen september my dearest lucy it seems an age since i heard from you or indeed since i you will pardon me i know for all my faults when you have read all my budget of news well i got my husband back all right when we arrived at exeter there was a carriage waiting for us and in it though he had an attack of gout mr though with hawkins he took us to his house where there were rooms for us all nice and comfortable and we dined together after dinner mr hawkins said my dears i want to drink your health and prosperity and may every blessing attend you both i know you both from children and have with love and pride seen you grow up now i want you to make your home here with me i have left to me neither chick nor child all are gone and in my will i have left you everything i cried lucy dear as jonathan and the our evening was a very very happy one so here we are installed in this beautiful old house and from both my bedroom and the drawing-room i can see the great elms of the cathedral close with their great black stem i am busy i need not tell you arranging things and housekeeping jonathan and mr hawkins are busy all day for now that jonathan is a partner mr hawkins wants to tell him all about the clients how is your dear mother getting on i wish i could run up to town for a day or two to see you dear but i dare not go yet with so much on my shoulders and Jonathan wants he is beginning to put some flesh on his bones again but he was terribly weakened by the long illness even now he sometimes starts out of his sleep in a sudden way and awakes all trembling however thank god these occasions grow less frequent as the days go on and they will in time pass away altogether i trust and now i have told you my news let me ask yours when are you to be married and where and who is to perform the ceremony and what are you to wear and is it to be a public or a private wedding tell me all about it dear jonathan asks me to send his respectful duty but i do not think that is good enough from the junior partner of the important firm hawkins harper and so as you love me good-bye my dearest lucy and all blessings on you yours minna harker Report from Patrick Hennessy. M. D. M. D. M. R. C. S. O. I it's our it's our to John Seward and the sword.
D. 20 September. My dear sir, in accordance with your wishes, I enclose report of the conditions of everything left in my charge. With regard to patient Renfield, there is more to say. He has had another outbreak, which might have had a dreadful ending, but which, as it fortunately happened, was unattended with any unhappy results. This afternoon a carrier's cart with two men made a call at the empty house whose grounds abut on ours the house to which, you will remember, the patient twice ran away. The men stopped at our gate to ask the porter their way, as they were strangers. I was myself looking out of the study window, having a smoke after dinner, and saw one of them come up to the house. As he passed the window of Renfield's room, the patient began to rate him from within, and called him all the foul names he could lay his tongue to. The man, who seemed a decent fellow enough, contented himself by telling him to shut up for a foul-mouthed beggar, whereon our man accused him of robbing him, and wanting to murder him. I opened the window and signed to the man not to notice, so he contented himself after looking the place over and making up his mind as to what kind of a place he had got to by saying, Lord bless you. I pity ye and the governor for having to live in the house with a wild beast like that. Then he asked his way civilly enough, and I told him where the gate of the empty house was. He went away. I went down to see if I could make out any cause for his anger, since he is usually such a well-behaved man, and except his violent fits nothing of the kind had ever occurred. I found him, to my astonishment, quite composed and most genial in his manner. I tried to get him to talk of the incident, but he blandly asked me questions as to what I meant, and led me to believe that he was completely oblivious of the affair. It was, I am sorry to say, however, only another instance of his cunning, for within half an hour I heard of him again. This time he had broken out through the window of his room, and was running down the avenue. I called to the attendants to follow me, and ran after him, for I feared he was intent on some mischief. My fear was justified when I saw the same cart which had passed before coming down the road, having on it some great wooden boxes. The men were wiping their foreheads, and were flushed in the face, as if with violent exercise. Before I could get up to him the patient rushed at them, and pulling one of them off the cart, began to knock his head against the ground. If I had not seized him just at the moment I believe he would have killed the man there and then. The other fellow jumped down and struck him over the head with the butt end of his heavy whip. It was a terrible blow, but he did not seem to mind it, but seized him also, and struggled with the three of us, pulling us to and fro as if we were kittens. You know I am no lightweight, and the others were both burly men. At first he was silent in his fighting, but as we began to master him, and the attendants were putting a straight waistcoat on him, he began to shout. I'll frustrate them. It was with very considerable difficulty that they got him back to the house and put him in the padded room. One of the attendants, Hardy, had a finger broken. However, I set it all right. And he is going on well. The two carriers were at first loud in their threats of actions for damages, and promised to rain all the penalties of the law on us. Their threats were, however, mingled with some sort of indirect apology for the defeat of the two of them by a feeble madman. They said that if it had not been for the way their strength had been spent in carrying and raising the heavy boxes to the cart, they would have made short work of him. They gave as another reason for their defeat the extraordinary state of drought to which they had been reduced by the dusty nature of their occupation and the reprehensible distance from the scene of their labors of any place. I quite understood their drift, and after a stiff glass of grog, or rather more of the same, and with each a sovereign in hand, they made light of the attack, and swore that they would... I took their names and addresses, in case they might be needed. They are as follows. Jack Smollett, of Duddings Rents, King George Road, Great Walworth, and Thomas Snelling, Peter Farley's Row Guide Court, Beth... They are both in the employment of Harris' sons, Moving and Shipment Company, Orange Master's Yard, Soho. I shall report to you any matter of interest occurring here, and shall wire you at once if there is anything of importance.
Believe me, dear sir, yours faithfully, Patrick Hennessy. Letter Minna Harker to Lucy Westenra. Unopened by her, 18 September. My dearest Lucy, such a sad blow has befallen us. Mr. Hawkins has died very suddenly. Some may not think it so sad for us, but we had both come to so love him that it really seems as though we had lost a father. I never knew either father or mother, so that the dear old man's death is a real blow to me. Jonathan is greatly distressed. 